We had been away from the eyes of the whole world almost three years. Thousands of miles away from civilization, lifetimes away from the madness them civilized men called slavery, there was me, a young Shoshone woman named Sakagawea, Captain Lewis, Captain Clark, and more than three dozen what I'd call volunteer patriots. Now, our mission seemed simple enough. All we had to do was cut a path through the savage Northwest Territories all the way to the Pacific Ocean, cross 4,000 miles of the highest mountains and fastest rivers any American ever seen before. President Thomas Jefferson called us his men of discovery. And every day we live is the day we all prepare to die just by the word of the president. See, we left St. Louis a small army of men. Three years later returned more like a band of brothers. Now the day went by that every man wasn't tested past his limits. Only way you survive that kind of pain if every man willing to give what the one beside him need to stay alive. Well, one has set in hard on us. Talk around camp was, if our luck didn't change, might be looking at starvation soon. One day, Captain Lewis calls me up, says, York, I want you to go out there and try your gift for hunting. See what relief you can bring to us. Now, I took that request just like an order, gathered up my rifle, started out early. Only been going about an hour or so for I come across some fresh tracks. Look kind of like bear tracks to me. Now, I don't know how many of y'all ever tried bringing down a bear before, so let me just tell you. Anything a man goes to, with half a heart, anything a man goes to with a whole mind, <laughs> either if you ask me, well, we was desperate. And I was determined to show Captain Lewis that his faith in me was well placed. I figured since the wind was blowing in my face, been doing so all morning, I might have followed them tracks out of ways. I'd obey even knowing I was coming. If I was to catch up to him, well, we just have to see what was what. So I followed them tracks out a mile or so, come over a hill, and there he was, way off in the distance, a slow-moving giant of a bear. By that time, I already made up my mind, and folks in no tell you, once York make up his mind, ain't nothing in this world set to change it. Found a good-sized tree, laid out my shot in powder, and I showed him a rifle. I was adjusting for the long range of the shot. About to pull up a little more account for the wind being blown in my face all morning. About that time, I realized, well, wind wasn't blowing in my face no more. Mostly kind of old bear throwing his nose in the air, letting out a growl that shook the tree beside me. I know my time for thinking was done. Boo! That first shot fell between the shoulders. Old Bear let out a growl, spun on his hands, come charging back at me, all claws and fangs. So I dug back behind the tree and started to reload, praying the whole time. I didn't make my first mistake with a rifle right there, because this is going to be my last mistake with a rifle. It seemed like it took me about an hour to get that next shot loaded. The whole time I think Old Bear must be breathing straight down the back of my neck, and I can't hear nothing because my heart beating so fast and loud, sounded like drums pounding my ears. Now somehow, I get that next shot loaded. Come around the tree, I was pulling the trigger before I even sighted up. Boom! That second shot hit him in the arm. Didn't even slow him down. And I knew there wasn't going to be no third shot. So I lowered my rifle, stepped out of the smoke to the right side of the tree, and I pulled my axe and my knife, and I waited for him. Well, see, I waited because it don't make no sense a man trying to outrun a wounded, angry bear. All that's going to do is get you cut down from behind. Where I see it, my best chance, maybe my onlyest chance, is to stand my ground and face him like a man. So I waited for him. Said a quick prayer for my wife and family back in Louisville. I said two or three longer prayers for myself, mind you. And I waited. Boom, boom, by that time a double report come from my left side. Turns out, Captain Clark had sent a couple boys to check on my success, and I was so glad he did. Both shots caught Old Bear square in the chest. And by that time, must have been nothing but pain and rage pumping that great big body of his. That finally give out on him, less than 10 paces I stood waiting. Took a second to gather my wits. I thanked them boys for their good timing. I thanked them again for their better shooting. And we set to skinning and cleaning as much of that bear as we could, as fast as we could. Because with all that smoke and noise, and all that blood, we feared the wolves might be coming. It's the last place man wants to be when the wolves show. So we pack as much meat as we can carry and head for camp. Arrive like, like conquering heroes. That night we feasted like kings. And the laughter absent from our fires for weeks slowly returned as hard, cold men began to speak more fondly of home and family and dreams. That night, 
On hard, cold ground, I slept the sleep of the dead. Dreamed of my wife and family back in Louisville. I prayed to God. I says, please, can't you just let, let me see her face? Maybe just one more time, these old eyes of mine, before you go tearing me out of this here world of yours. My name is York. Just York. It is the name my daddy carried before me. I was born a slave. No, I was born to be a slave, to be the property of another man. And that is the shame my daddy carried before me. But I have seen a world few white men might ever dream of. I have climbed the top of snow-capped mountains. Swum rivers so swift that the buffalo lose their foot. Watched whales dance across the cool waters of two oceans. And I have walked amongst the people. Those Americans you call Indian have welcomed me into their lands with open arms like some long lost brother. And now, I ask you, hear of the things that I have seen. So that when I am gone from here, my name, my voice, my story does not die with me, for that is the way of the people. It is the only thing I have left to give. Well, now, the hardest part for me was always the not knowing. See, many times before, Master Clark and I go on adventures, sometimes leaving home for months at a stretch, but always understanding we'd be coming back. Once we sailed from New Orleans all the way around New England, it took us nine months at sea, and as soon as we touched ground, we rode hard for home. There's something different about this mission of discovery. Everybody talking about where we going and what we doing. Nobody said a word about when we coming home. That concerned me. Well, that and the fact. See, nobody ever asked if I wanted to be part of the president's mission of discovery. No one ever asked if I wanted to lay down my life for this nation here. Because I was just a slave, you see. Now, the funny thing is, you know, if I was a free man, I could not have volunteered to lay my life down for the president since I'm just another man's slave. Nobody cared to even ask. Now, once we crossed over the Missouri River, well, for me, it's like crossing the River Jordan. Found myself the other side of changed man. See, the Indians we met, many had seen or least heard of a white man before, but they ain't seen nobody like me. Started to give me names like Black Indian or Big Medicine. Some even say that I was a gift straight from God. <laughs> you know, I kind of liked the way them Indians was thinking out there. Now, we set our second winter camp at the Mandan Village. Called it Fort Mandan. That's where we met Sakaga and her husband, Charbonneau. Now, mind you, we call him her husband. But all told, heard how this Indian girl was told from her family she was young. How this old Frenchman, Charbonneau, bought her in trade from the Hidatsa Indians, decided to make her his wife. And maybe that's why we so close, me and her. I mean, she the only one out there know, like I know, it means to be called the property of another man and all. And she was great with child when we met her. Give birth to little Pompey over the winter. Now, I sat outside the lodge waiting for him to come to the world. When I heard him crying, I told Captain Clark, I says, Captain Clark, now, as long as that girl and that baby with us, you ain't got to worry for them. Every it take to keep them safe, sir, I'm prepared to give it, even if it cost my life. And as sure as I'm standing here today, you best believe I kept them safe. That same winter, we met old One-Eye, chief of the Hidatsa Indians. He refused to come visit for a long time, kind of. The Hidatsa Indians had supported the British during that revolution of a war. Guess we all know how that turned out for him. Anyway, they say that Word of the black man finally got to old one eye. He just couldn't take it no more. Had to come see what everybody else been talking about. So he come to Fort demanding to see me. Well, I stood there before him. And first thing he did was to lick his thumb good, start to rub as hard as he could, thinking he might take the black right off this man. He said he was afraid it might be another trick by the white man. He just had to be sure. But when it didn't come off, don't you know he started to look at me different? Like I am somebody special. And that's when I did what I always did with a new chief of tribe. I stripped my shirt down bare and I stood there before him, arms out far as I could hold him. I let two 
Sometimes I let three of them Indian warriors get up in each hand, and I stepped back and picked them up till all their feet was off the ground. And let me tell you something. They ain't never seen a man that powerful before. They said a man like that. They said that this man right here had to be touched by God. Captain Clark was quick to agree with him. He says, well, surely you ought to respect a man with that kind of power, he says. But if you respect this man, then you must respect the white man, because for the white man come along. This York, his kind, they were nothing but savage animals. And the white man captured him. And the white man tamed him. The white man made him a slave. If you want to respect all of that power, and you should, then ain't you got to respect the man can take that kind of power and make a slave. And sometime Captain Lewis might fire the air gun once or twice, draw the attention back. That's when they start to explain them Indians, how they're going to be part of a new tribe now called the United States how they're going to have a, a new chief and great father, we call president, how they have a duty to protect the president's warriors in their lands or suffer for it. Now, I don't know how many times I heard them tell one chief or another tribe that story before I understood they were saying. They tell them Indians, they get to be American. Not like y'all American, they just, they just get to be more colored American. By my figuring, the misery I call life, it ain't got room for more souls. I wish I could have made myself so ferocious, I could have scared them all away, or at least warned them. But I don't speak the language. Besides, who was I? York, the slave of Master William Clark. So sometime I just, I just excuse myself from the lodge. Go out into the cold night air. The little Indian children, they always follow right behind, say they know that a gift like this can't stay one place forever. They want to be close as they can until God decides to send him on his way. Sometime, I ask God, one day he might forgive this man what he couldn't do for them innocent children. <clears throat> so, uh, we stayed with the man down to the geese, been flying north about three weeks. Once the ice starts to break on the lakes, the captain says it's time for us to make our push for the rock mountain. Now, the man then say, any man got a hope of making them mountains need three things, good supplies, better horses, and a man that knows the way. They say the Shoshone Indians, the best place for all three. So our mission changed. Before we can go to the mountain, we got to find the Shoshone Indians. We got to find the snake people. Now, for the next few weeks moving up river, we had no contact at all. Finally, Captain Clark says, well, maybe a small detail of men working in from the water have better luck. When he called the name of the three that would accompany him, well, you best believe my name was on that list because he knew. Wasn't the step he could take, I wasn't prepared to follow. So we walked five days, almost 75 miles. By the end, our, our boots were tore through and our feet bloodied. Had to stop and wait for the others to catch up. When they did, well, Captain Lewis drew a fresh detail of men, and they proceeded on. A few days later, we got word. They finally met up with the Shoshone, and we had to get there fast as we can on account of there's a lot of concern, a lot of agitation. See, this many armed white men so far in the Indian country just making everybody nervous. Now, they told them, we traveled with an Indian girl and her baby, and that set them at ease some, figuring no self-respecting man going to go to war, but not with women and children. But they say that word of the black man already made itself upriver. They all just standing around waiting to see what everybody else been talking about. So when I step out the boat, they start to gather around me like the others. That's when Captain Lewis calls Skagawea over to translate with words, since she speaks the language, instead of all that hand talking at drill yard so good. And now that's when we got our real surprise. Remember I told y'all this young Indian girl told her family she was a child? How this old French man Charbonneau bought her and traded from the doctor, make her his wife? Well, she say she don't remember much about being a child. But what she do remember, her big brother, his name, Kamehawe. Now, it turns out, the man these Shoshone called chief now, he carried that same name. 
without even trying to, we found a way to bring a family back together. Now, I don't know about where you come from, but in my life, ever the change of slavery, tear family apart, nothing short of dying going to make it whole. This was God working, made it easy to trade for supplies and horses. Kamehameha was so pleased, he'd give us his best tracker. Old man, he say, know them mountains like nobody living. Now, the old man's name was awful hard to pronounce. <clears throat> Captain Lewis says this. He says it's because civilized tongues weren't meant to speak such savage words and all. Just call that old man Toby and be done with it, he says. Now I was of the mind. Well, see, I figure. Any man gonna look at the mountains I'm looking at right here, make a solid promise, keep me alive all the way to the other side? Well, I say a man like that ought to be called. Ever in the world he tell you to call him. Nobody asked what I was thinking. And I wasn't up for volunteering, so, so old Toby leads us up to the bitter root. Before we got in good, we come across the Flathead Indians. They like all the others we met, except maybe more so it come to me. See, the Flathead tell us in May tribe, when a man goes off to war and he is brave, when a man goes to battle and he is strong, the greatest warrior on the field, they say that is the only man done earned the right to paint his skin black with the coals from the war fire. So when he returned to the tribe, everybody knows without asking which man among them was the greatest warrior, which man was the strongest, which man had been touched by God that day. So, so then flathead figure, if God ever made up his mind to take a man and paint him black like that for good, and they say, ain't that got to be a great man? <laughs> I sure liked the way them flathead was thinking. But we didn't stay with him long. On account of this mountain. Now, if I was to never see another mountain until the day I died, that'd still be about 10 days too soon for me. Because all I can tell you about the mountain we're looking at here, there ain't no way a man will make it out the other side of that alive. Going to serve as a grave marker for the president's men of discovery. Now, I wasn't the only one thinking it. But we couldn't turn back. We had our mission from the President of the United States. We either succeed or we shall perish in the attempt. So we push hard into the bitter root. Once we got in good, a storm come out of nowhere, dropped 10 hard inches of snow. We lost our path, started throwing packs and losing animals. It got so bad, we had to put down two colts. We shot them dead and we ate them whole. But there was no doubt we were dying. Finally, Captain Clark says, well, maybe a small detail of men push hard as they can against us here mountain, break way to the other side. Gather whatever we can gather, come back for the rest. It may be our only hope, he said. So he called the name of the five or six men he counted on for this most important mission. And you better believe my name was on that list. Because he knew. Only way we ain't breaking through this here mountain if this heart of mine stopped beating against them rocks. So we push hard against that mountain that finally break way to the other side. And the Nez Perce Indians, they was kind enough to trade us for root, berries, and salmon. We got everything we can carry. Then we went back in for our friends. Once we make it out the other side, we stayed with the Nez Perce several weeks. It took a few days just to fill the bones and our bodies again. We so cold. While we healed up, we made new canoes. See, the Indians taught us how to fire boats out. Now, always before you want a canoe, you take a tree trunk, you put the axe to it, and you carve yourself a boat. They taught us how to fire. Take that same trunk, you lay red hot coals across it, and you burn away one layer at a time. So when you're done, you got a boat run smooth in the water. And you got no leaks. You got a good craft. The Indians taught us that and a lot more. And they keep us alive out there. Well, once we all healed up, the captain says it's time for us to make our run for the ocean. We left our horses and a few supplies with the Nez Perce on the promise of returning, and we proceeded on. Next few months was much of the same. New chiefs, new tribes, tell them about the United States, about the president. <clears throat> Captain Clark even named a group of islands after me. He called them <clears throat> York's Eight Islands. Ain't that got a good sound to it? And then one day we coming down to Columbia, and the captain started to shout, Ocean! Ocean in view! Ocean! 
We had made it to the Pacific Ocean, 4,000 miles of high mountains and fast rivers, all that way, all that suffering and pain. You know we only lost one man. He was a good man. His name, Sergeant Charles Floyd. Come with us up out of Kentucky. He grew up in Louisville. You see, his family figure the God they know and love. But he never intend one man owning the soul of another man. They say they don't want no part of a state going to make that the law. So they moved across the river to Indiana, the free country. Yeah, I was with Sergeant Floyd when he died. I did everything in my power to make him comfortable, and I sat there and I cried with him. But I cried for all the men. I never know one true God-loving soul, kind of him early passing this world. But we still had good reason to celebrate because we had made it to the ocean. Now, the first order of business at Station Camp was to set our last fort. And the captain decided they're going to put it to a vote which side of the river we're going to settle, one being good for hunting, the other good for building and supplies. And he went around one man after the other saying what he thought it ought to be. And they get to me. And everybody looking like I'm supposed to say something here. Now, y'all know better than I. Law of this nation say a Negro man ain't got the right, not under the Constitution, not under God, to put his word upside a white man. Cam Clark, he said, it took every man, his blood, his sweat, his whole heart to get us this far on the most important mission for a nation of men. The way I see it, he says, means every man doesn't earn the right to say where we go from here. York, the time has come for you to vote. <laughs> so I voted. Right there beside all them white men, I put my word up and it counted for something. Now some say, maybe that make me the first Negro man in this whole country vote legal side of white men. I don't know if that's true. But I know it felt good. It sure felt right. So we decide to settle the south side of the river. And we set to building Fort Clatsop. The next few days, I was putting my back into it. Some days, I'm hauling trees as big around as my body all by myself. Wanted to show every one of the men how much I deserved that vote. I couldn't leave no room for question. Cam Clark says, I was working so hard, I fatigued my body. It was laid up a few days, but I made my point. Once camp was set, we started making regular journeys down to the ocean, sometimes just to bring water back to boil down for salt. There's something to put on that awful food we've been eating for three years. <laughs> Some days, where we just sit at that water for hours and watch the whales. Y'all ever seen a whale before? Well, have you? The way he moves across the water so smooth you can hardly see him there. They'll bring that great big body all the way out. You can see just how great he is before he dives down and disappears altogether. I sit at that water for hours watching them whales trying to imagine in my head and my heart what it'd be like if a man carried that kind of freedom. If a man could run as far as he want to run. Nobody tell him it's time to come back or you ain't got a right to be there just because the color of your skin. I, I couldn't even see what that kind of freedom looked like. One day, Cam Clark come through. He says, York, it's about time for us to put our mind back on civilization. Our mission for the president is complete. Our success will be going home soon. Now, mind you, them the words I've been waiting to hear since before we left St. Louis. Me, the only man out here away from the world, got a wife and family, maybe didn't give them up for dead. I couldn't wait to get home. One night, Cam Lewis called us all around the fire. Say, he'd been thinking about what he might tell the president of these United States about his brave men of discovery about these men that sacrificed more than any patriot or to volunteer his nation, about these heroes that made the president's dream come alive. And he started to call out the names one after the other, like he might present them to the president. 
After every name, there'd be a hoop here, a holler over there, and because I started up at the fiddle, we, we was having a good time. We was having so much fun, I don't think anybody even noticed. I mean, maybe nobody noticed besides me. One time he finished, let's not the name of them brave heroes, sacrifice more than any patriot or the volunteer his nation. By the time he finished, calling out names men that made a president's dream come alive. You know, my name wasn't on that list. Maybe that's when it come clear to me what it is Captain Clark been saying. He say, York, it's time for us to put our mind back on civilization. He's saying, York, it's time for us to put our mind back on walking three steps behind, not looking the white man in the eyes to pass him on the road. York, it's time for us to put our mind back on not saying anything unless somebody commands you to speak. York, it's time for you to put your mind back in change, boy. Because we're going home. Because we're going back to civilization. So folk ask me all the time, they say, well, if you had it so good out there, them Indians treating you like God and everything, why would a man come back to living like this? Well, I had my reasons, my wife, my life. See, man can't run away pretending he's free. He ain't got the ones he loves beside him because that ain't no freedom. Besides, I figure all them children need to know what it was I seen out there. Need to know there's a place in this country people see you coming, they don't run you off to the corner, they don't spit on you. Instead, they ask you to come and sit down right beside them. They ask you to eat the food right off their plate because it means that they have been blessed by God. I figure if I didn't tell them, well, they might never know they was more than slaves. So I had to come back. Well, truth be told, I figure it's only a matter of time. Us getting back to civilization, me gaining my own freedom. See, before we left on this mission for the president, Master Clark freed Ben. Went on on about, <clears throat> seeing as how servitude for life is against God's will and the natural order of mankind itself, I'll be giving Ben his freedom for faithful service in my house to my kin. Well, Ben's a good boy. Been with us a while. But not like me. See, I've been with Master Clark my whole life. More than 30 years, me right by his side, out one day failing. I figure after the last three years we didn't had, all we got to do is make it home, and he's going to make me a free man. I couldn't wait to get home. Starting back up that river, we're making such a good time like we're walking on water. Every tribe we get to, we trade more boats for horses the faster we could go. We get back to the nest first. Captain Lewis ordered us trade everything we don't need to survive for root. I don't know if y'all ever had root before. Well, it ain't the best tasting thing in the world. Well, it might be the worst thing I have ever put in my mouth, and they're saying a lot after bear, dog, and buffalo, but we know it'll keep a man alive. And all we got to do is survive this mountain one more time, and we're going home. You know, Captain Lewis even cut the buttons off his uniform and gave them to me to trade. All told, we come back with 20 bushels of root, more than any man ever want to eat his whole life. And once we clear that mountain, we start back past the Shoshone and the Arikara, the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Sioux, the Oto, all the way back to St. Louis. When we get close to town, it looked like a parade started up. Folk lined the road far as I could see. Most of them give us up for dead years ago. For a few days, they stopped me on the street, asked me about the president's mission of discovery, asked me about the Indians we met and the great things we've seen. Then I went back to my duties. I, I, I tried to smile. I tried to not look a white man in the eyes. I passed him on the road. But it was so hard to lower my head again. But finally, Cam Clark says, it's time for us to go on home to Louisville. When we get home, I sent the word out. When the work day's through and all the chores is done, everybody's to come around. If it take all night, best be prepared to sit all night for I can tell them everything I can remember about the last three years. And I told them everything. Now, mind you, most they couldn't even believe I told them anyway because they need to know. Soon on, it was time for us to go on to Washington City, report to the president. He gave every man 320 acres of good farmland for his hard work. 
Every man double duty pay in gold coin for a sacrifice. Every man the appreciation of an entire nation for making a president's dream come alive. Well, I was in the slave quarters you know, waiting to be called before the president. But that call never came. For long, it was time to go on home. Cap <clears throat> Master Clark been promoted to general, chief Indian agent for the entire nation. Say to carry out his duties, he's going to be moving his house to St. Louis permanent. Say he can't see himself going about new service in a strange land out his most prized possession, his favorite slave right there beside him. So I asked him, I said, well, Master Clark, <clears throat> if, um, if we move into St. Louis for good, then what about my wife? What about my family? And he answered my question with a question. He said, what about them? I didn't give you a, a lawful law, and I expect you to file without question, he says. It's time for you to be done with that wife of yours. He said, when we get to St. Louis, I'll find a new wife. But I order you to be done with that wife. Now, I can't believe them words coming out of his mouth like that. See, the whole time we out there away from the world, him going on and on about Miss Julia Hancock of Virginia, how he can't wait to get back to his civilization and take her hand. So, so I thought that meant he knew how Man needs somebody he can run home to when the world been standing on his back all day. A, a shoulder he can cry on if he got to. Somebody tell him, as long as you know somebody loves you, tomorrow got to be better than today. I thought he knew what it was for a man to give his heart away. And then he ordered me to be done with my wife like I like see some stray dog I found on the side of the road. We, we get home, and I packed the house. <clears throat> Mass Clark went by boat, and I led the slaves and wagons overland to St. Louis. When we get there, I made up my mind. The folks know, tell you, once you make up his mind, ain't nothing worse had to change it. I, I went back to Mass Clark and said, Mass Clark, it seems to me you got lots of business interests still to attend to in Louisville. Seeing as I didn't took care of your business most of our life together, I reckon I'm the best man for that job. You could send me back to Louisville, handle your business, put me right close to my family. Now he said he can see what I'm getting at. He ain't going to stand for much of that talk out of me. But he'd allow me back to Louisville four or five weeks to finish up his business and to sell his boat for St. Louis. When you return, he says, I expect you to be done with that wife of yours and set to get back to your duties as an obedient slave inside my house. Four or five weeks for a man to throw his heart away. Well, about five months later, he sent word to his brother. I must have misunderstood his orders because I've been gone four months too long. But some need to understand about that. Wasn't no misunderstanding here. Sometimes a man got to do what's right by him and his God. Instead of what another man tell him. But I knew him. If I did not sell for St. Louis directly, that'd be the devil to pay. Well, Master Clark told me, he showed me what it's like to be a real slave, threatened to sell me down south, New Orleans. They said he got ways down New Orleans, crushed a man's soul and grind his bones into the earth. They say, you ever find yourself a slave down New Orleans? You ain't never going to see nothing you love again the rest of your short and very painful life. I done seen it. So I knew I had to sell before I push off. My wife, she come down the water and see me. She said, a man she called Macedon decided to move his house further south into slave country. She said, well, if you plan on selling that there boat back for St. Louis, I, I reckon you best turn on around. You turn around here, y'all, take one last long look at your wife because 
chances is you ain't never going to see this face of mine again. Now, them few words. They almost did with the hardest three years of my life. Couldn't do almost stop this heart beating dead in my chest. But I knew I had to sail. I didn't have a choice. Slaves don't have choices. So I sailed. By the time I got to St. Louis, I decided. I went back to Master Clark. I say, Master Clark, since we've been together my whole life, me by your side more than 30 years, we were little boys. We used to wrestle together, hunt, fish, ride horses all day long up and down the rivers. We was all there. I went about my duties with respect. You ain't never have to question my Lord to be you or your kin. When you fell down, I picked you up. When you were sick, I made you better. If somebody was to threaten your life, don't you know I would slay a man with these bare hands or lay my own life down if it see you one second safe? And for three years, well, me and you, we stood side by side against the whole world. And I didn't get one acre of good farmland for it. Nobody dropped one gold coin in my pocket. And President Thomas Jefferson, well, he don't even know my name. But Master Clark, well, I see it. You're the only man in the world power to give me what I need right now. Make me a free man. Billy. Save my family. You know, I, I thought Master Clark might hurt himself. Hardly laughing, what does that got to say? Say he think it funny. Me thinking any service I done rendered my whole life, more than 30 years by his side, is more than what a slave does for his rightful master under God. Said, if he'd seen such immense effort out of me, he'd reward it, but it ain't come yet. Besides, he said, you are a much too valuable piece of property for a man just to let go like that. That's what he said. Much too valuable piece of property for a man to let go. So I figured it's about my value, so I could do something about that. Started to agitate, doing things just enough wrong. He know it's by my choosing. He say, he's see what I'm getting at. I ain't going to stand for much of it. Now, mind you, I try to smile. I try to not look a white man in the eyes. I pass him on the road, but I cannot lower my head again. So Mr. Clark had me strapped to the post. Paid a man good money to beat me until I could not see. And after I heal up, I try. Not speaking unless somebody commanded me to speak. I just couldn't hold my tongue no more. Master Clark had me locked in the jailhouse. 30 days in the jailhouse. Every one of them days worse than that beating. Somewhere in all that, maybe he figured whatever broke in me sure wasn't getting fixed fast enough. So he finally decided to go on and send me back to Louisville. Now, I don't know what the letter already sent on to his brother, seeing as I, I can't read, but I've been guessing at it. I reckon maybe that letter says that it's time for York to know what it is to be a real slave. It's time for York to know what it is to have a severe master. Know how good his life has been till now. Well, I figured that's what that letter says because that's the lesson his brother set to teaching me. They hired me out to a man, dressed me in rags and threw me in the field, strapped a big old bull plow across my back, and for two years that old man tried to grind my bones into the earth. And for two years I ain't heard one word from Master Clark. And finally news come through his nephew. He done decide to go on and see me free. Only been 10, maybe 11 years since we come back on that mission. Most slaves my age don't ever see freedom. But everything I'm fighting to be a free man falls out of my hands now. My wife, my whole life is gone. Master Clark said in the drives business, running freight from Richmond, Kentucky to Nashville, Tennessee. Now, folk ask all the time, what sense would make a free man riding headlong into the slave south trying to do business? Well, I had my reasons. 
Because somewhere along them road, somebody done seen or at least heard Taylor, that family, that told in my life, and all I need is a direction. And if this business of mine was worth anything, man might have enough gold in his pocket one day to buy his heart back. But there's things they don't tell you about the slave south. How they got these laws say a free man ain't fit to be associated with slaves, kind of he might be telling them slaves what it's like to be free, and they might get the mind they deserve the same. The punishment being 90 lashes in jail if you're a lucky one. And there's folk you meet on the road, kind enough, offer you a warm fire and a hot meal. Telling you stories how a man might lay his head down free but wake up and change because without them freedom papers you keep right next to your heart, you ain't nothing but a runaway with a good story. So I couldn't be with my own, couldn't trust nobody else. And this wasn't doing that good. Guess it didn't make sense to... White man hiring somebody like me, it ain't good for slaves, see that kind of business going on. Them that did hire didn't always pay. Because the law say a Negro man can't go in the court and swear out against the white man, under Constitution or under God. Then my horses started dying. Figured they was being poisoned. It finally got so bad I had to hire myself back into hard labor. One year contract of breaking backs. I'm done with it now, and I ain't never going back again. But I know some things now. I know now. I ain't never going to see my wife again. Except every night when I close my eyes, she right there telling me, as long as you know somebody loves you, y'all, Ma got to be better than the day, and God, God, God sure gonna take care of his children. But I, I am not ready to die yet. And I know now that a man cannot live like this. So I come up with another plan. I figure if I can make it back out to the Missouri River, back up to Indian country, my things could be different. Maybe somewhere out there a man could walk down the road and people ask you to stop and talk a while. Children ask you to throw them into the air and catch them with your strong hands because it means they've been blessed by God. Maybe somewhere out there a man could live. Or maybe a man could just die like a man. And I aim to find that place. I expect to perish in the attempt. Now before I go, I was hoping y'all could do me a favor. If she's of the mind, the way I see it, one day somebody might ask you what you know of Captain Lewis and Captain Clark, of the president's men of discovery. You could tell them. You could tell them that you know a man with skin as dark as night. That you know a black man who walked stride for stride, who suffered pain for pain with the greatest heroes this nation might ever know. You tell them that my name is York. Just York. It is the name that my daddy carried before me. And although I was born into change, you tell them that I am not now. No, you tell them that I have never been the property of another man. Been the property of another man. And I ask you this so that when I am gone from here, my name, my voice, my story does not die here with me, for that is the way of the people. And the sad truth is, these few words, they are the only things of value I have left to give. Well, the sun has finally set. Now, now my journey must begin. Godspeed. Whew. Whew. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me find my glasses so I can see if there's more than two people. 
Good evening. Y'all bring house lights up for me? Is this water for me? Thank you so much. Uh, let me take a deep breath here, y'all. There y'all are. So good to see you. I am Hassan Davis, and this is my very first live performance in over three years, so thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Okay, as I kind of catch my balance and get, get acclimated here, I would love to take a second, a minute, however long you got tonight, to answer any questions, any comments, address any concerns about the program. Please, the only rules you can't all speak at once. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Um, this project grew out of the Kentucky Humanities Council's Chautauqua series. Uh, this was my second Chautauqua I developed. Um, and it came about at, at the crest of the bicentennial of Lewis and Clark. Uh, I was touring my first uh, one-man show, Chautauqua, which is the story of Angus Augustus Burley, uh, an African-American who was enslaved in Anderson County, escaped enslavement to join the Union lines at Camp Nelson and became a soldier. And then after the war was invited by John Fee, the founder of Berea College, to be one of its students and became its first African-American graduate. So I had been touring that across the state and then across the nation. And um, someone said, you know, you, 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 this is amazing. You should do something. Lewis and Clark Bicentennial is coming up and you should do something for that. And I was like, I feel like I'm a pretty good actor, but I'm not sure if I could pull Lewis or Clark off. That would take a lot of work, you know. They were like, no, no, York was there, you know, and, and I was, a, I, I'm embarrassed. I didn't know this story. And so I started to dig into it, and I started to do uh, primary document research, going through the journals, and, and there he was, this amazing story that had been sitting there for 200 years, untouched. And at the bicentennial, a moment, an opportunity to introduce him and widen the story and deepen the story. And so uh, dug into the research. My friend Jim Holmberg with the Filson Club, the Filson Society, Historical Society, um, had just started to edit and publish the books, the, the letter of William Clark that no one ever knew about. So this last half of the program, everything after the expedition, a lot of people say, well, you know, you can't just make up new stuff. I said, well, yeah, you're right, but this ain't new stuff. But what we continue to do is uncover pieces that we haven't had. And what we learned is that William Clark had been writing to his brother over the 20 years after the expedition, and those letters had never been seen by anyone. Someone in Louisville, the story goes, what Jim told me, there was a family in Louisville, big house, historic house, and the matriarch had decided to get rid of everything that was in the attic that nobody knew about, and so they hired some people to come and store it all away, and someone had the, the good sense or the good luck to check and see what it was. And it was uh, trunks and trunks of nothing but letters from William Clark to his brother. And in those letters, he talks about York being surly, talking like he did something. I told him he just did what I told him to do. He didn't do anything amazing. And that wife of his is getting him to agitate. So I told him, get rid of her. I'm going to find him a new wife. And he's not acting right, so I'm going to send him back to you. And I want you to show him what it's like to be a, a slave for real so he know how good I've been to him. And then he'll want to come back to me. And if he doesn't, Sell them down to New Orleans, you know. So, so all of that story is William Clark's voice. You know, you can even see it sometimes in the letters. He is, he is so upset and angry, it, it like, almost like his right hand attacking him. He can't imagine why York can't just go back to what they've had. And he, he, the world changed 0% for him on that adventure. And it changed 100% for York on that adventure. And their lens was so different, he couldn't even see and recognize that. And so that became the thing that created all that, all that turmoil after the fact. And, and, and it was a, to be able to introduce that on a national stage. You know, I, I was telling folks at dinner, you know, one of my programs was picked up in Kentucky. They were doing one of the pre-events before the Bicentennial, and all of the Bicentennial partners were there, and they, and they had me as a Chautauqua presenter. And uh, immediately after... They, they wrote me in and said, okay, you will be York for the Bicentennial. So literally, the National Parks and Department of Interior picked me up, and I became York. I told this story from Harper's Ferry all the way out to Fort Clatsman, back to St. Louis, 
to, to be a part of this story. And the, the, the coolest thing is most of that time, I was hanging out with William Clark's eighth generation grandson, Bud, who was portraying him. And so we were, so, so and, and you know, the first time I did this program for him, I was like, dude, I, I just need to, how does this feel, right? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about your people. And he was like, you know, it, it hurt a lot. And I had to hear it, right? This story is not complete without, and so we, we, we've created this great relationship and friendship, you know, and he was a real advocate of making sure that this story was being there. He said, because, you know, half a story is not a story. And in order for us to really see collectively as a nation of people who we are and how we have represented across the story, then we all have to be there and, and we have to be seen. And so that was a really amazing moment to be able to connect and, and, and dig into it in such a personal way. So I know I did ask if y'all had questions, so I'm going to stop talking because clearly I like to talk and see if there are any questions. I'll go back here and I'll come up here. Yes. <clears throat> Great question. So there's, there's a lot of mystery. The story up until those letters were discovered were based on an interview that Washington Irving, legend of Sleepy Hollow fame, Washington Irving interviewed William Clark in about 1832. In that interview, he said, you know, whatever became of your man York? He was like, well, you know, we got back our freedom. I gave him a horse and wagons, great business. He fell miserably, you know, couldn't get up early enough, was terrible with business, right? You know, that's kind of code for, right, stupid, lazy, all the stuff that, that supports this, this superior, inferior, this slave master kind of thing, right? All the stuff that supports that conveniently became the thing. Now, here's the thing. Over the course of the four years of the expedition, it's estimated there's about a million words of text that was written in the journals that we found. We lost a few journals. About a million words of text, all written by white men who grew up in a society that told them that from birth, from an accident of birth, right? You know, no even choice. Just an accident, random rolling the dice of where you were born, you automatically had absolute and divine dominion over another people. It didn't matter that you were smart or you were courageous or you were, you know, you were brilliant or tactical. You just had to be white. And so this was their lesson. All of these men understood this emphatically. And in one million words of text, writing about their worst and best days, not one time, not one time did any one of these men who were told that by birth they were superior write something about him that stepped into that stereotype. In fact, when they wrote about him, they talked about his courage. They talked about him stepping in. They talked about him hunting. They talked about him contributing. They talked about the fact that when the tribe met him, they start going, going to him. And they're like, no, no, he's not in charge. We're in charge, right? You know, and so all of this is in there. And so I imagine, I said, you know, if in all of this written by people who were told what the story was supposed to be, and they didn't, that meant something to me. You know, the whole idea that at the edge of the world, when nobody was watching, the captain said, you know, everybody contributes to this, everybody gets to decide what happens next. At the edge of the world, for a split second, they lived out the body of our Declaration of Independence. They lived out the core of what the Constitution was supposed to be. And in that moment, they, because they, they understood the diversity, that diversity was the thing that allowed them to survive. And I know I, there was a question about what happened to us, but I want to get to this piece. That diversity, that we, you know, we got this debate going on, but diversity is absolutely, so traditionally what happens when we did expeditions, expeditions were put on by like the eighth son of the Duke of Earl, because they're like, I ain't never going to be in charge. I'm never going to have the land. I'm not going to be the one making decisions over all the thousands of acres. So I'm going to go do something. I'm going to go explore something. And they got all their buddies who are like the eighth generation or the eighth kid of some duke. And they all got together and said, okay, we're going to go to Africa, go to China, go to India. We're going to explore and discover something so then our names live. And that's usually what they type. And they were never heard from again. Right? They all had the same skill set. They all had the same way to respond to things. They had the same education. They had the same mindset. And so when they encountered a difference that was dramatic, it usually was traumatic. End of story. But when Lewis and Clark were tapped, first Lewis was tapped to do this. And he said, you know what, I can't do this by myself. I'm really smart and I do a lot of things, but people don't like me a lot. But my buddy, William Clark, 
Everybody loves that guy, right? He's the redhead guy that everybody loves to party with. So if I convince him to partner with me, we could probably do this together. And so first, there's shared power. It doesn't happen a lot. And then they said, you know what? We're going to do this. We're going to have to get men that actually understand the world that we're going into, not the guys we went to school with. Because they're good guys, but they ain't going to keep us alive when things get really hot. And so we need woodsmen, will rights, blacksmiths, warriors, trained, people who understand, and can navigate, be flexible. And so instead of going to the aristocracy, they went to the, the poor folks, the enlisted men, and the poor people who understood and navigated the world. That's who they drew from. And they drew from this whole cadre of French and Indian boatmen, the best navigators on the rivers, but nobody dealt with them. And Drouillard, who was their hand talker and their primary hunter, was the highest paid member of the expedition. He was Shawnee and French. Right? And so they got this hodgepodge, crazy group of people together. People were like, why? What are you getting? You're doing this for the president. Why are you, you know? But they had a sense of it. And so when they got out away from the world into an environment that was totally hostile and different, every, every encounter could be life or death, it started to pay out. One of the elders storytellers of the Missouri Oto tribe I ran into on this trail in one of the events, he said, you know, when they encountered our tribe at the Council of Bluffs right there in Iowa, it was now Iowa, the first sub-chiefs that they encountered was a member of the Bear Clan. And the story goes that he immediately recognized York as the embodiment and the spirit of the bear, his brother. And so he actually went to York and said, hey, brother, what are you doing here? What are you doing with these guys? What's going on? And, of course, York don't understand nothing he's saying. And finally they're like, no, no, it's not him, it's us. And Drew York gets everything laid out. When they finally have the Council of the Bluff, when they finally have the gathering explaining to the, tri the tribes who they are and what they're here for, the story goes that that sub-chief excused himself and went on a two-week fast and meditation because he had to find out why his spirit didn't recognize him. And I was like, whoa. So because of this connection, there were people who allowed them to speak. When they had Chicago Wheel there, a woman and a child, it meant that they were not a war party. When they had Cruzat there, Cruzat was the fiddler. He was also blind in one eye. He did shoot Captain Lewis in the butt. But that's a whole other story. But he was great because he spoke a couple languages. He was a boatman. He was their fiddler, their entertainment. But here's the thing. When they were encountering some of the Sioux nation, the Sioux were not impressed at all. The Sioux were like, you know, we've been doing all the stuff y'all talking about coming up and doing for centuries. Why y'all showing up here? This is our space. And so as they were trying to negotiation, there happened to be a woman who had married into the Sioux nation from the Omaha tribe. Cruzat was French in Omaha, and she came to him after everybody went broke for the night. She's like, hey, brother, so it appears that they like your horses more than they like you, and they have a plan for the horses to live. Do what you got to do with that. And so Cruzat was able to go to Labiche, who spoke English and French, and tell him in French, hey, we got to go, man, because they're going to kill everybody tonight. And Labiche was able to go to the cabin and say, we have to do, you know, we have to do our diplomatic thing and make a good excuse, but we cannot be here. And because they had that diversity, they were able to escape, which would have been a clear end. When they came through the mountains, an elder of the Nez Perce Nation met me at, one of the, at the signature event in Louisville. Big C-SPAN, we were about to launch the, the mission. I mean, we were doing the whole reenactment. We were marching, singing, headed to the big kill boat. And he was like, come here, before we get started. He, no, over here, away from the cameras. He says, I need you to know your story of us. He says, when they came through the mountain, we had already heard they were coming through the mountain because we had people coming through. You know, Toby brought them through the long way. We had people coming through telling us about what they were selling way before they showed up. We had decided. Everything stops here. We ain't buying what they're selling. When they come through half dead, we finish the job. He says, but the first group that came through had that black man. And in our nation, you either paint your skin black because you're in deep mourning or because you have done amazing. And either one of those demands everybody pay attention to you. He says, so you need to understand that the only reason they made it further was because he walked out of those mountains first. And I just need you, if you're going to tell this story, you need to carry that when you tell this story. And so those are the kind of stories that I started to fill and gather, right? 
Sacagawea would say, no, you don't want to eat that because it's going to be really bad for you. Or, yeah, this, so, so all of this together, this, this unique band of folks that nobody would be able to sit, they couldn't sit in the same room and have a conversation together back in civilization, but because of what they did, they held the world together. And Clark said, hey, everybody gets to vote because of that. It was the most amazing display of real leadership and recognizing the unique talents and gifts of everybody who shows up with you, except when he got back and he said, okay, <clears throat> so we're probably not going to talk about this to everybody, right, because there's a lot of power. He had a lot of things going on that he didn't want to risk with the whole story, with the real story. And so, and, and we, we've seen it through our own history for, forever, right? We make those adjustments. In our nation, in our, at those pivotal moments, the moments we call most essential to us, Revolution, Lewis and Clark, 1812, at every one of those moments, the Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War I, the Harlem Hellfighters held the line for 100 days, 100 days in French uniforms because the Americans said, we don't want y'all wearing uniforms, make them think you're Americans because y'all are black men. But they held the French line for 100 days without giving up one foot before America officially joined in the war. One of the most battle-hardened and, and, and challenging spaces against Germany. We don't know about him. We don't know about Jean-Jacques Boulard, who left the South when he was young, took a freighter, stowed away a German freighter to Europe, made it over to France, joined the French Foreign Legion, became part of the first encounters with the German army at the beginning of World War I. After his unit got decimated, he went to flight school, became a pilot, a, a fighter pilot. And so when America joined in the war, he went over to the American Air Forces, you know, Air, Army Air Forces, and said, hey, I want to be a pilot for America because I'm American. And they're like, you know what? Black people can't fly planes, fool. He was like, but I just flew my plane over here to say I want to. like, no, 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 no. So he went back, right? Because we, we have a story that we have to hold on to. And then there, so let me take a deep breath. I know there was a question. So William Clark told him that he freed him and gave him all that. And then he fell miserably and he died of cholera trying to get back to him, wishing he were still his slave. That was the official account. But these letters call that into question because it shows that at least 10 years out, he was still kind of stringing along when he finally did it. There's no manumission papers. But here's the real thing. In that same time span, mid-1830s, a team of trappers working for one of the fur companies report that they encountered a small war tribe of Crow Indians, numbering about 50, that the chief of this small war tribe was an old black man who told them in English that he had gone to the ocean with Lewis and Clark. They report that they stayed with this tribe for several weeks on the way out and back, that they witnessed them in battle against the raiding band of Blackfeet Indians, and as everybody was about to abandon the camp, the old black chief jumped up on a rock and said something too effective, I'm not even an Indian, and I won't allow these men to take this land, and you will do no less than me, and charged head first into the battle. When they mourned the dead and celebrated the rout of their enemies, the story goes that the old black chief was untouched. Now, this is a detailed story by multiple people over time who say, oh, yeah, York, I saw him. He chilling. Life's good, right? And you have this, this, this account from William Clark where he says, I heard he died trying to get back to me wishing he was my slave because life was terrible without me. So I'm a lawyer by training. We call that hearsay evidence, right? Somebody told me that somebody saw him wishing he told somebody else Right? And hearsay evidence is very hard to get into court, very difficult to prove, right? Johnny's going to probably go home at the end of the day if somebody just saw that, somebody saw that, somebody said that, somebody saw. But then you have this group of people that said, oh, yeah, I saw him. Eyewitness accounts, on the other hand, you're in trouble, right? Because if somebody saw you and they can put you at the scene, they know. But this is, so this is the way we codify information in our society, our environment. But all historians listened to that and looked at that and said, hmm. No, we should probably not go that way because that, you know, because Clark is a credible historical witness and, and if he said that that's what happened, we should hold that as the truth 
even though he said that somebody else told him. And so in the, it's one of the few times that I've found in my research that people are willing to actually bend our own rules of, 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 of authenticity in order to make the story fit. You know, for my money, unless somebody's got some candid video footage that says otherwise, I want to believe that he made it. I want to believe that he made it because I want to believe that no matter how difficult any of our lives might be, we might one day be lucky enough to look up and be surrounded by people saying, did God send you to hang out with us? We feel so blessed. And thank you for taking the journey. Right? I could only hope that that was anything that any of us could hope and imagine for. This question over here. Oh, we, okay, we got it. Good. I'm really bad at like, until I've been locked up in my basement for two years, right? Um, so I'm like, you know, uh, any other thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? About anything, not just about York, I guess, you know, I don't know much about what's happening in Ukraine right now, so I want to talk about that, but most other things I'm pretty good at. Any thoughts about the, the production itself? Any? Yes. Thank you. It has taken a long time. It used to, um, it used to really, I really love doing this because I think it's such a valuable way for us to, to enter into a difficult conversation and imagine different how we could be and move in that conversation. But it, it, it used to take a, a heavy toll. I mean, it still does. I, I feel it, right? But I've learned, I've, I've got 20 years of, of this, and so I don't go back to my room and, and collapse and cry anymore. Um, but, but, you know, I did. You know, I did, a, I did a performance about 10 years ago, and there was um, a group of, of elderly African-American women right on the front row. And, um, and the whole time, there was this knowing, as I was telling this story, there was just this knowing. And, and it, it, you know, the emotion of it was, was, was powerful, but... In the Q&A at the end, one of them stood up and she said, I'm glad that I live long enough to hear somebody finally tell my story, you know? And um, yeah, it just sent me right over the edge, you know? And, but there's a value to it that I think is, is immeasurable. And so I've learned how, I mean, I, I, I meditate, I've been doing theater, so I, I know how to decompress and get out of it. Um, but when I first started historic interpretation, it was very different than doing Shakespeare, and I love me some Shakespeare, but very different when you're just kind of, you know, throwing somebody's stuff out there, but uh, this, this is a little more personal. So it, it, it takes some, some getting used to. Um, what I love about it is that it's also uh, a level of vulnerability that I, I get to enter into in this conversation uh, that is a gift for me to be able to be open and and just be framed, but I think that I've, I've, I've never felt unwelcome by an audience to really go and, and, and draw them into this story, even though it's a story that has laughter and tears kind of tangled together. Um, and so uh, for me, that's, that's absolutely worth it, and it's one of the pieces that, that makes me stay in this. Uh, people are like, why are you still doing this, you know? Uh, you could probably find some other stuff to do, right? But uh, this, is, this is important, but I appreciate that question. Yeah. I am from, well, I live in, outside of Berea in Paint Lick, Kentucky, but I'm from Atlanta and, and St. Louis. Um, I came to Kentucky, um, I came to Kentucky to live, to live, you know. Uh, 18 years old, I just got expelled from alternative school. Had a juvenile criminal record that had me on probation since I was 11. I was dyslexic and ADHD, and um, and I lived in 13 different homes and went to seven different schools. And I got my GED, and folks were pretty much saying, "Wow, congratulations, you survived this long." And I was like, uh, "This can't be it." My mama told me I could do more. When I get picked up at the police station, I was 11 years old. It was a lot of drama that day. At the end of the day, my mama had to borrow a car to come get me. And when she did the paperwork and we started that long ride home, I was waiting for her to, to curse me out and, and yell. And because, you know, we were struggling and still navigating and trying to 
uh, keep a family together. And I finally got the courage to look up at her and, and she looked down with these tears in her eyes and she said, baby, if you could see what I see every time that I look at you, then you would know how great you already were. You know? And it was the gift of putting me in a place, not in my place, in a place where I had to imagine the greater me. She introduced me to the stories of the great kings of Africa. She introduced me to Nelson Mandela. She introduced me to Langston Hughes and the stories that I never got at school. And she told me these are who you are and you need to remember that. And so that became the anchor as I came through school and navigating, you know, Berea and, and, and all that stuff of really holding on. So those stories resonated with me. So as I became a, an actor, this idea of actually being able to tell stories that entertain and at the same time pull us into a conversation uh, were powerful. And so I started doing that. I graduated law school and I wanted to get back into theater and, and I realized this was that way, right? I couldn't do ensemble. I couldn't do Shakespeare or, or big groups of things because I had to work and stuff. But this I just pack it in a suitcase and I could jump in my truck and I could be in Mayfield or I could be in, in Prestonsburg. You know, I actually did a performance on this stage about 15 years ago, probably longer than that, but it's, it, it was when I was still with the Humanities Council. And so I could be in all these places. And, and that just became a great gift to be able to, to, be able to get out wherever somebody wanted, wanted me to be and to, to tell this story and start this conversation. Uh, so, and, but I've, I've taken this story all over the country. I've, I've toured um, along with Lewis and Clark. You know, Joe Lewis is my third. I do a Civil War soldier. I do New York, and I do Joe Lewis the boxer. And, uh, and I've got like eight or nine in my head that I'm like, I got to get to. Um, but, but this has just become an amazing way to share space and stories that allow us to get past that intellectual thing, right? Oh, can't talk, don't talk about it. Oh, don't talk, no, oh, quick, don't make eye contact, right? Because it takes us straight to the heart of a human being and it connects us. And then it pulls us into it in a way that allows us to, to see, see folk and see each other different. So I'm, I'm blessed for that. And so as long as I can do it, I'm going to keep on doing it. I'm going to keep on doing it. And, you know, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I don't know what's next. Ooh, sweet. I don't know. You talk about that. 